Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's Geoscience Australia seminar. Uh, my name's Dr. Trevor Jew. I'm the acting branch head for the National Earth and Marine Observations Branch, and I'm going to be the chair for today's session. Uh, I'd, I'd like to begin today by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land upon which we all meet today, uh, pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. And I'd also like to extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and any other First Nations people around the world who are attending our seminar today. Uh, so I'm conscious we've got a, a, a pretty big and a pretty ambitious seminar today. The title is Geoscience Australia and the Wonderful World of Drones. What are they? What do you need to know before you start using them? And frankly, more importantly to us, how can they be exploited for our science? Uh, we, have a, we have five presenters today. So we have Dr. Mark Broomhall, Dr. Steph McLennan, Dr. Andrew Walsh, Guy Byrne and Dr. Dan Clark, who are going to take us through um, the, the role of drones within Geoscience Australia and for progressing our science. Uh, because we have so many speakers and so much to talk about, I'm going to stop here and hand directly to the team to go forth. If you'd like to know more about our speakers, their bios are up on the website, but I'm going to hand directly over to Mark, who's going to kick us off. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Trevor. Okay, so uh, our talk today is uh, Geoscience Australia and the Wonderful World of Drones. Um, so uh, I'm going to give a bit of an overview of uh, drones and some rules, uh, and then we'll have a bit of a talk about um, the, the science that we actually uh, do here at Geoscience Australia with drones. Uh, so there's a, a brief rundown of uh, sort of what we do. I'll start and um, I'll finish. So uh, time permitting, I'll show some possibilities. Otherwise, we'll just go straight into conclusions and, uh, and um, questions. So anyway, what are drones? Uh, what are the rules for flying drones? And, and what is a REOC? So um, I'll explain some of that in a minute. Uh, drones can be either uh, fixed wing or rotor drones. So uh, most common that people will see are the multi-rotor drones. So four, six and eight is fairly common, uh, but they can be sort of any kind of configuration. Uh, even that thing down at the bottom right hand corner is uh, actually a submersible drone. So uh, even though it doesn't fly, um, it actually can use the same basic software that the other drones use. So there's a there's, uh, huge scope for drones and what they can actually do. So uh, what's in a name? Uh, you've probably heard UAV, UAS, but maybe not so much RPA and RPAS, which is the terms that um, CASA like to use. Um, so they're all very interchangeable and they pretty much mean the same thing. So a drone is an airframe, uh, so something for everything to go in, uh, to strap everything to. You need some kind of flight controller and you need a GPS, a compass or an IMU. And this is essentially what makes a drone a drone. So uh, you can have a um, like a model aircraft and they may not have these uh, flight controllers and GPS and IMUs. So this positioning makes everything really stable and you can also program in uh, automatic flight paths and things like that. So you need some kind of remote control and receiver because you can't fly with these things autonomously. You have to have control over them. You need some kind of power. This is generally a battery, but you can use uh, uh, petrol powered motors or even hybrid systems are sort of coming on, online at the moment. Uh, you need some sort of electronic speed controller. So this actually tells the motors uh, and the propellers when and how to uh, um, operate. So this gives you your lift. It also gives you your, your maneuverability. So you need some sort of telemetry uh, so that allows you to see where your drone is. It can put your drone um, on a map so you can see where it is on the map. It may have a um, compass on it so you can see where it's pointing. And if you've got a camera system, you can actually see uh, what the drone sees. Uh, and so to make these things useful, you need some kind of instrument package or a camera. Uh, and these are often on a gimbal. So the, this takes the relative movement of the uh, airframe out of the, out of the picture. So you can just uh, concentrate on what you're looking at on the ground. So rules, so this is taken directly off the CASA website, so um, anybody can go in there and have a look at these. Um, but the, the rules are the same, whether you're flying um, as a, uh, a business or undertaking or you're actually doing this uh, for um, recreation. So something that's changed recently with drone registration is um, they've updated the what's called a micro drone from 100 grams to 250 grams, uh, which means now that our Mavic Mini, which is the you can see a picture of below. Uh, we can now fly that at Geoscience Australia because if you look at the map, Geoscience Australia is just inside that exclusion zone. Uh, as I said, um, drone registration came in in October, so this has actually changed a few things with about um, 
uh, flying on what they call the excluded category. So it's now much easier to fly um, without a repo, which is a remotely piloted license. Uh, so you can't fly above 120 metres above the ground. So that's whether you're at sea level or on the top of Mount Kosciuszko, it's still 120 metres. Uh, you can't fly within 30 metres of people. And this means um, uh, horizontally, not just over the top of their heads. You can only fly one repo at a time. Sorry, remotely piloted aircraft. Uh, if you're near an uncontrolled uh, aerodrome, uh, you have to land or manoeuvre away from the from the aircraft. In fact, if you see an aircraft, they always have the right of way. Uh, you must keep your repo and line, your remotely piloted aircraft in line of sight, so you can't fly at night or in fog or anything like that. Uh, also, you can't fly in a dangerous manner. You can't really fly over emergencies, and you have to respect people's privacy. So they're the basic rules. Uh, so. GSMS Australia has a REOC, which is a remotely piloted aircraft operator certificate. Um, this is issued by CASA. Uh, so the basic setup of that is the CEO's uh, the head of the um, REOC. So you have a chief remote pilot and a maintenance controller. Uh, and these people are actually inside our documentation. So um, they have to be named. Uh, then you have remotely uh, remote pilots. Uh, you can have instrument operators and spotters. And you can also have authorised main maintainers. So the CEO and the maintenance controller, we can just appoint those people, but to be the chief remote pilot, you have to do a bit of extra uh, testing at CASA. So what are the point of having a REOC? Well, uh, there's lots of paperwork and record keeping, so you have to keep logs of everything. Uh, CASA has oversight on this, they can come and ask to see your records, and these things are renewed every two years. And if you're not doing the right thing, they can take your REOC off you. You can also be fined quite heavily if you do the wrong thing, and also if you have an incident, you, this has to be reported. But what are the pros of having a REOC? Well, if you have a REOC, you can do almost anything that um, anything outside the rules that I've just I mentioned in the last slide. Uh, and also, importantly for my group, is that we can actually fly a, um, a drone with a maximum takeoff weight of up to 150 kilos with approval from CASA. Anyway, that's enough of the boring stuff. So um, we'll just move on to something more interesting, and I'll hand you over to Steph. Thanks, Bob. Morning everyone, my name is Steph McLennan and I'm an Antarctic geoscientist at Geoscience Australia here. Um, and I want to take you on a little bit of a tour and snapshot of using drones in Antarctica and some of the things that we've done with them recently. The image that a lot of us have of Antarctica is a is an ice cube covered by snow and ice, but there are actually quite a few small areas that are permanently exposed, um, rock and, and sediment. These areas are isolated but they're also quite, uh, they're real hotspots of activity with tourists, like you see here, expeditioners from national programs, scientists and wildlife really competing uh, for real estate, so to speak. Some of these areas, like this one here, is they're hard rock, so they're fairly resilient uh, and not terribly susceptible to human impacts and damage from things like walking tracks. But there are some areas that are particularly fragile and unique, even by Antarctic standards. Any activities in Antarctica, particularly as a scientist, um, they're closely assessed and managed, but under the treaty system that governs Antarctica, there are extra, extra protections available. And these are known as Antarctic Specially Protected Areas or ASPAs. Um, outside the Antarctic treaty system, these, are, these protected areas are backed up by domestic legislation. There are real penalties and consequences for Australians breaking laws uh, in these areas. And any activities, even just going into such an area, um, needs an application that's managed and any activities, whether it's sampling, maintenance of equipment, installation of equipment, drone flights, anything like that, is really weighed up against the environmental costs and benefits. There's over 70 ASPAs that are declared in Antarctica and they're designated for various reasons. Uh, it could be their historical significance, say Mawson's huts um, at Cape Denison, wildlife, um, say particularly good um, or unique penguin colonies, moss beds, and there are actually a handful uh, that are designated for their geological significance and values. There's one such area called Marine Plain near Australia's Davis Station. It's our southernmost station. And this is uh, Marine Plain. It looks fairly bland and monotonous, a lot of boulders and some outcropping uh, bedrock, a lovely glacier in the background. But what's remarkable about this area was that in the 1980s, scientists stumbled across um, essentially fossil dolphins, um, some really good specimens that were sticking out of the ground, 
a number of individuals found of a now extinct species uh, called Australodelphus myris. They're toothless, they're thought to be uh, suction feeders, squid, uh, squid eaters, and a lot of work was done to study these and also extract a number of the specimens. And our own Natalie Schroeder um, at GA was involved in this work in the late 80s and, and early 90s. There are still fossil fragments that remain um, at Marine Plain. And it's not just the fossils um, that are vulnerable to disturbance sitting at the surface there. The geological unit that these fossils sit in is incredibly fragile in and of itself. Um, there's this very thin surface crust of gravel and cobbles that you can see. And then you can see what my boots did uh, when I visited this summer. I'm not particularly tall, and yet I'm, you know, you can see I'm sinking in easily four or five inches there. And it's this really um, diatomaceous, silty, sandy um, marine deposit dating back millions of years. And stepping into it, it's a bit like a flare going off. It just goes everywhere. And those shoe prints, um, they could sit there for years before they recover and before they're filled in um, and disappear. It's not just human impacts um, that we're conscious of in such a fragile area. It's a surprisingly dynamic environment that's changing quite a lot naturally. Um, on the left, you can see these boulders and cobbles. They're naturally um, being heaved and sorted and fractured by permafrost. Um, creating sorted circles um, and uh, frost wedges. And then on the right, uh, we've got a bank of fossil uh, marine shells uh, from nearby. And this bank has been cut and turned into a gully uh, by meltwater this year, particularly warm and um, heavy melt year. And then that bank's actually collapsing um, into the gully. So there's quite a lot of natural change um, that can threaten the stability of fossils um, um, as well as direct human impacts. And so some of the key questions that we had about this area was, how do you keep track of an area um, that people might only visit every few years? It's quite difficult to get there. How do you address continuity between scientists and observers? I've been there once now, but I might never go there again. And so my observations um, and assessments might differ from another scientist. Um, and how simple can we make baselining? You know, if we're capturing this area in its current state, how simple can we make it? Can we make it cheap with few personnel and low technical requirements um, in terms of expertise and, and technology. So earlier this year, um, uh, Jodie Smith and I visited Marine Plain with the support of the Australian Antarctic Division. Uh, and we took down a couple of DJI Mavic 2 Pros. Um, these are small drones, they're less than a kilo. We we're carrying everything on, in on foot, so they needed to be lightweight. Um, they're fairly cheap, easy to run. If you know someone who has a drone for fun, it's probably a DJI, uh, and there's a good chance it's a Mavic series, maybe a slightly larger Phantom, but they're kind of the iPhones of the drone world. Um, and so we took these in and um, did some surveys, um, and I'll show you some of the results we got. In terms of what's already existing to capture this area, we've got some really good aerial photography that you can see on the left and in the center. Um, and on the right is a structure from motion model that we generated from overlapping drone photos that we took this summer. The aerial photos, they're taken usually from helicopters. Um, they're great for covering large areas, but they don't always capture the fine detail that we need um, in some of these vulnerable sites. And so I'll take you through some of the detail that we can capture. If we zoom into that aerial photo, this is probably one of the highest resolution ones we've got. Um, just keep an eye on this. Uh, outcrop of, of boulders here um, when we go to that 3D model. So this is that same area um, and this is a 3D point cloud captured by overlapping areas and you can see as well that between when that aerial photo was taken um, and now there's been a big sheet of geotextile installed uh, to protect fragile fossils um, that were at the surface there and vulnerable to erosion. Because it's a point cloud we can manipulate it in 3D and start to get a sense of um, when you're not necessarily on the ground, you can get a, shape, a sense of the shape of the landscape. And to give you a better sense as well of the kind of detail that we can capture quite easily, this is maybe 20% of the whole model. Um, it covers a couple of hectares. We mapped it in about 40 minutes of flight time. And these yellow blobs in the background there, they're actually our backpacks um, that we have with all our survival gear and equipment. We can get higher resolution than this, but you're starting to trade off flight time as well in the area that you can cover. With that point cloud, we can generate surfaces and we can also generate digital elevation models. Um, and this is especially good over larger areas 
where we can get a sense of the shape of that landscape and start to predict um, where we think natural change might occur. There's actually some frost wedges there um, just to the left of that um, red box. And again, on the right, you can see that um, covered area um, and the sort of slope and shape of that, of that landscape. In terms of where we've got to um, and where to from here, yeah, I think we've showed that small, cheap consumer drones are a really simple and effective method uh, for capturing simple baselines of vulnerable areas. Um, the platform design, as I said, is quite simple. For this area, it works well. We have particularly good weather, especially in summer. That's not the case in all of Antarctica. Um, for example, near Mawson Station, we have catabatic winds and obviously a, a one kilo drone isn't going to um, necessarily perform well there. Um, we we're flying in about zero degrees and it didn't have a huge impact on flight time. Um, spent a lot of very cold mornings in Canberra winter last year testing that out um, and it did really well. But again, in areas where it's particularly cold and windy, you're going to have to adapt and perhaps get something larger and more robust. From here as well, we can look at non-expert data collection. With apps like Drone Deploy, we can task um, and set our flight paths, our altitude, the kind of re spatial resolution we want. We can set that from anywhere in the world. And then someone on the ground with a drone can actually task it um, and collect that data for us and send it back for processing. We don't necessarily have to have a scientist on the ground every time we want to do one of these repeat surveys. In terms of ground control and positioning, I think this will be the biggest step change um, that we can look at in terms of baselines and, and monitoring change um, in these sorts of environments. The, com the navigation on, on drones is getting better and better and better. Um, the days of them flying off into the sunset, so to speak, are, are pretty much gone. But we don't have really precise ground control for this survey. To do that, we would have had to trample around with an RTK GPS, putting in temporary ground control, picking it up afterwards, and essentially causing a lot of the damage we were trying to protect against. But RTK drones um, and better positioning is becoming more available. And so if we want to really look at quantifying change more um, in a more automated way um, and having that really precise control for repeat surveys, then we certainly need to look at the better positioning. I'll leave it there um, and hand over to Dan. Uh, g'day everyone, I'm Dan Clark. I work in the earthquake activity within Geoscience Australia. I don't have any penguins, but I have earthquakes. So um, I guess the major uncertainty in earthquake hazard assessment in Australia and intraplate areas worldwide is whether the short historical record of seismicity, essentially the last 200 years in Australia, is representative of what we might expect into the future. Um, my angle on that is if an earthquake is large enough and shallow enough, the rupture envelope can intersect the Earth's surface, producing a fault scale. Um, in Australia, the left-hand uh, image we have here is a map of 370 instances where we suspect that large earthquakes have ruptured the Earth's surface and produced a fault scale. Now, we don't have a good idea of the magnitude of those earthquakes, but 11 of those earthquakes have occurred in the last 60 years, and they are the red dots. So we can use the historical earthquakes, where we know how long the fault scarp is, how high it is, and the magnitude of the earthquake that we've measured to calibrate the prehistoric earthquakes um, and that's the graph on the right, which is basically a log of the scarp length against the um, magnitude of the earthquake. Now, traditionally, um, you collect those uh, data on length, height uh, and magnitude in the field using surveying techniques like an RTK GPS on the right hand photo. Touching in both instances is very important. Um, geologists can tell how old the scarf is by putting it on their tongue. Um, but there are some limitations in this technique in that all earthquake deformation at the surface is not going to be as sharp as these fault scarps that I've shown in this picture. You can get distributed deformation if the deformation is not entirely in a vertical sense or, or if it's a strike slip deformation it's also going to be harder to recognize and harder to quantify with a GPS system. So 
into the drone, into what I do. Uh, we use a slightly larger drone than Steph has used in the Antarctic slide she showed, so a Phantom 4. Um, it's a bit over one kilogram, it's a bit more stable in the air, it flies for a little bit longer. Uh, we can get approximately 10 hectares of flight um, area each battery and we can have multiple batteries. So uh, the structure from motion that Steph mentioned uh, in the previous part of the talk, uh, the right hand picture here is showing you essentially the acquisition pathway that the drone uses. So it's flying back and forth, back and forth, collecting a series of photos and in a similar way to topographic maps are made, photogrammetric, photogrammetric techniques are used to compile those photos using uh, perspective and offset of the vision into a three-dimensional map or a point cloud. Now, here's an example from the Peterman Ranges earthquake in 2016. On the left-hand screen is the extent of the surface rupture that um, formed with a, an insider interferogram over the top. So the, the fringes represent deformation, the scarp is the black line, and I've put in uh, a series of drone missions, that uh, 10 missions in total, 164 line kilometres flown with this machine, and on the right-hand side is a digital elevation surface that I've generated from those pictures. And you can see that that model is about three kilometres across, and the strips are uh, 50, uh, 500 metres wide, rather, and you've got a very good representation of that surface deformation. And we were lucky in this case that it was a fairly flat pre-earthquake surface. So we can see the, the deformation envelope quite well. And you can keep on zooming into that, um, that surface. Like this is now four centimeter resolution digital elevation model, three centimeter resolution ortho image. And that's our camp on the, the right hand image. We found the only tree to camp under. Um, and you can start to see now that even if you're not mapping for earthquakes, uh, if you're just a geologist out there and you want to map a rock platform, then you can get some really detailed information of exactly what the ground looks like at the time that you're mapping. And the, the time lag between the flight acquisition and having a digital surface to map on is, is a few hours. Um, so here's a, just a, an example of structural mapping of that same area. So you've got a pretty good idea. And, and I've worked with the Joel Survey of Western Australia too, and they're mapping complex structural metamorphic relationships in rock outcrops that are only a few tens of metres across so that they have an enduring record of what was done and what they saw in the field. Um, if you were lucky enough to have uh, in the earthquake space a pre-event topographic surface, or if you do multiple collections using your drone, then you can actually start to map landscape change. And I'll use an example from the Lake Muir earthquake in 2018 for this. We were lucky enough to have pre-event LIDAR over the top of the earthquake, which was a magnitude 5.3 in this case, about 280 kilometres southeast of Perth. Uh, this is the, uh, the INSAR interferogram showing a deformation envelope of that earthquake with the scarp trace in the white and the black to the east and a picture on the left of what the scarp actually looked like. So it's much more uh, subdued scarp than the Peterman earthquake scarp. And there are a lot of trees and bushes in this area too. So it was a bit tricky to, on the ground, quantify what that scarp looked like. Um, so we were, in this case, able to fly another drone survey over the top of it with good ground control. We had an ITK GPS out to provide the ground, ground control. And then we were able to difference the digital elevation model of the drone against the pre-existing LIDAR to make a, a DM of difference, in, a sense, in essence. So a um, deformation envelope, um, which shows only the deformation or only the landscape change. Um, and this is a bit noisy on the right-hand panel, I'm sorry, but I'll try and summarize. The blue lines in um, panel A and B uh, the line of sight deformation that the INSAR satellites are seeing, and that's a vector and so depends upon uh, the angle between the slip vector of the earthquake and the, which way the satellite is going, um, whereas the drone is actually telling me a true vertical deformation, and that's the red line. So you can see that the, the INSAR is not giving us a... a uh, a ground true uh, representation of the rupture envelope 
whereas the drone data in this case is showing us exactly how high it is, which allows us to better calibrate that uh, graph against displacement and magnitude that I showed on the first slide. Um, the downsides of uh, these drone surveys is that uh, they, it's a photogrammetric technique, so it doesn't see well through trees, but you can bump up the sampling to try and fix that. It doesn't work at all through tropical canopy, but open forest will be fine. Um, but, and these things tend to get attacked by eagles, which is a problem as well, as opposed to a larger machine, but I guess an eagle's not going to attack, attack Mark's 150 kilo drone. Um, but it's basically allowed us to extend our field investigation at much less cost than it would if we commissioned a LIDAR survey. And I've been able to fly, fly in what's called a sub two kilogram excluded category, according to CASA, which means I don't have to fly under Geoscience Australia's operating certificate, um, but I am restricted in what I can do. But that's actually working for me here. So. It's a cheap and easy method of collecting a lot of very detailed data about landscape change that just about anyone can do. And I'll probably leave it there and hand over to Andrew now. Thank you very much. Just organizing my screen. Um, so unfortunately I don't have penguins or earthquakes, but I do have sharks. Um, and just to switch things up a little bit, I work at GA alongside Mark and Guy, but I'm going to talk about a project that's not related to my GA work, but it is a drone project. Um, so it shows you a larger breadth of problems that drones can tackle. Um, and it also uses an artificial intelligence solution, which is something that can be directly applicable back to GA um, in things like a cloud masking or land cover classification systems. So this project came about um, through myself and Cormac Purcell on the AI side of things, uh, wanting to develop an app that people could use in the field to real-time spot animals. Um, on the other side of the team is uh, Paul Butcher and Andrew Colfax from New South Wales Department of Primary Industries, and they focus on the beach management and the drone side of things. So for a few years, DPI have been contracting uh, surf lifesavers to fly drones off a few beaches. And Cormac and I managed to uh, gather some of that data together and put together an early model that runs in the field. So these images here show typically what happens uh, in the field. So the surf lifesavers use a DJI Mavic Enterprise drone, one of these things here, specially fitted with this doodad on top, which is a loudspeaker. So if the pilots do see something dangerous, they can immediately alert, alert anybody in the water. But it's quite challenging for them to be able to um, spot anything dangerous because they're doing a lot of things under rather adverse conditions. It's very noisy down at the beach. Um, it's very sunny as well, which makes it difficult to look through the dedicated tablets um, screen that you see here. So the pilots are not only flying the drones, but they're also trying to look through this screen to identify anything dangerous. So that's where the AI comes into it. Um, we come up with a real-time solution that runs on this Crystal Sky tablet to um, uh, easily pick out sharks or any other marine species. So we organized a trial earlier this year um, for about a six week period uh, over five northern New South Wales beaches. We flew up to about a dozen drone flights per day um, using the DJI Mavic Enterprise drones with a standard controller and the, that Crystal Sky tablet. And the great thing for us um, in the AI side of thing is we've, we've got over 200 hours worth of footage. So I want to give you an example of some of the things that the pilots saw. So the image you see here is the start of a video um, over a bull shark. And the square boxes are what the AI draws, as well as the label tag BUL signifying a bull shark. So I'll start the video playing now. And these first three videos basically show some of the interactions we've seen between sharks and humans. So this is a typical thing that happens. You see a surfer come in and the bull, bull shark does a 180 and gets out of the scene. 
In the next one, you can see that the, um, the box that's drawn over this bull shark is quite jittery. Uh, the bull shark is off again. Um, I'll explain why it's uh, jittery in a little bit. Um, but I particularly uh, like this video because it shows a, a quite scary interaction between the bull shark and the surfer. And I'll note that the surfer probably didn't know that there was a bull shark underneath them at this stage. And in the last video that's just about to start, you'll see a small white shark at the bottom of the screen. Um, that takes an interest in one of the surfers. There it goes now. Um, loses interest, finds another surfer, gets a little bit inquisitive, and then thinks better of it, and off it goes on its merry way. So these are the sort of interactions that we see um, out in the field. As far as the AI goes, well, um, I can't get into too many details about this. There's not enough time for that. Um, but for those of you in the know, it uses a convolutional neural network. And without going through all of these uh, complicated diagrams, all you really need to know about this particular type of neural network is it works on an individual image of the video feed. So that's why you saw those boxes being jittery before, because it's uh, the model's running on every frame of the video. It takes an individual frame. And it draws many, many boxes over that frame and asks the question, is there something of interest in one of these boxes? If the answer to that is yes, then it goes ahead and calculates a list of probabilities for all the classes that we're interested in. So a class might be, is it a white shark? Is it a bull shark? Is it a surfer or is it a dolphin or something like that? So if I go back to this last video here, um, this is a video of an eagle ray. And you can see how the boxes are drawn over the eagle ray. It very nicely follows it. Um, but occasionally, the boxes flicker on and off. So when the box is off, that means the, the data is just not good enough for the model to be able to reliably associate it with an eagle ray. But if I stop it, like I have now, on any random frame, if you look carefully within that box, you probably agree with me that there's a dark blob in there. But you'd struggle to be able to say that that's definitely an eagle ray and it's not a, a shark of some description or a turtle or whatever. So this shows the real power of this AI solution. It does a very good job with these things. So where are we up to now? Well, we've got these 200 hours worth of data, and we're busy finishing the uh, very long task of manually tagging all the animals that we see in the uh, data. And then we feed the, these uh, tag data into the model, and it creates an improved model that's much more reliable. <clears throat> so we expect even more reliable results in the future. All of this uh, runs on an Android app that sits on that Crystal Sky tablet that you saw earlier on. And the idea is that we can update the app um, for use on beaches, hopefully early in 2021. And that's the end of my part. I'm now going to stop sharing and hand over to Guy. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, look, while Mark uh, sorts out um, the technology, look, I'm going to provide some context as to why uh, Digital Earth Australia have been moving into remotely piloted systems for our validation work. Um, and in, before I do that, I'll give you a quick summary of what it is we've been doing in our field validation program. So. In, 19, oh, in 2017, our DA embarked on, on a pretty ambitious national campaign to validate its uh, analysis-ready uh, Landsat and Sentinel-2 data sets. And in this, we enlisted support from CSIRO and a range of universities around the country. Now, Landsat 8 and Sentinel-2 are broadband spectral sensors, uh, and they you know, sensitive from the, the visible to the near-infrared up into the SWIR. Whereas field validation um, involves taking a, a, a backpack hyperspectral uh, spectrometer into the field, which records data at hundreds of narrow bands. 
which you later resample to, to match the bandwidths of the satellite in question. And in this case, you then apply the same packages of corrections that are applied to the ARD data, uh, such that you can pair the two. Now, um, it's a it's truth universally acknowledged that uh, capturing quality spectral data in the field is, is not simple. Historically, it's been difficult due to a whole range of sampling compromises, um, poorly calibra calibrated instrumentation, uh, the complexities of radiative transfer, and, and other sources of error and uncertainties. And, and a lot of these errors and uncertainties sort of come from three domains which are central to Earth observation. They're sort of radiometric, geometric, and scale-driven. The radiometric issues these days have been mostly managed through calibration and advances in atmospheric look angle correction and the like. Um, the geometric uncertainties uh, have been dealt with through improvements in geolocation, geocoding and, and resampling. But the scale of ground measurements has been the ongoing problem, like how do you emulate a bird's eye view or in this case a satellite's instantaneous field of view. You know, Landsat 8 sees at 25 metre pixels, Sentinel-2 looks at 8 metre packages. Um, so how does a researcher with a backpack on uh, approximate this? So in the past we've used you know, ladders, towers, cranes, even low, slow-flying aircraft, and each one of those is a bit of an OHS minefield. So it's in this domain that you know, uh, RPASs and sensor miniaturisation uh, have really, are really set to revolutionise uh, Earth observation validation. So look, this slide just sort of talks to uh, what it is we've done in phase one, and the takeout message really is just the selection criteria over there on the left. Um, you know, the sites are a level, fair to low vegetation. They are spectrally diverse, but, but they're accessible. Um, I'll talk to the Litchfield site uh, at, a, at a later slide. So this slide sort of describes the sampling that we undertook in phase one. You know, conceptually, an operator walks along with a backpack spectrometer, takes up sort of, you know, 5,000 um, spectra over a one hectare site, which we later convolved to match the satellite bands, uh, the satellite overpass that we're, we're truthing. Um, then those data are pushed to a similar um, analysis-ready processing model, you know, normalised to a common sun angle and look angle. And then the image pixels that, con that contain the transect data are extracted and um, uh, the whole site is compared that way. It sort of looks like this. This is an example taken by some CSIRO colleagues um, up in Queensland. It was one of our high value overpass days. It was a dual Landsat 8 and Sentinel 2 overpass. Um, and so, you know, figure two sort of shows the lines walked. Figure three is a sort of a temporal map of the, of the spectra as it's captured. Figure four is a, a, a record of the downwelling solar irradiance. Figures 5A and 5B sort of speak to, well, you've got your, 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 your full resolution um, field spectrometer data in the top left there. Then it's convolved to the uh, bandpass functions that map uh, Landsat 8 in 5A and Sentinel 2 in 5B. The, 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 six, the figure 6 is sort of speak to the, that's the actual image data from the overpass and on the right hand side of each of those blocks are the actual pixels that were used uh, to extract um, uh, data for the matchup. And there on the right hand side we have the end result which is uh, the matchup for that day, Landsat 8 and Sentinel 2B with the one standard deviation error bars. So just in summary, this is what we did in phase one. Over the course of a year, we, we did uh, 55 uh, 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 coincident overpasses. Um, and overall, it was a very successful project. Uh, you know, this is the money shop. You know, um, it, it's the a set of uh, correlations that you rarely see in, in Earth observation validation. It's certainly been the most successful project I've done uh, during my time in this uh, field. Um, but it speaks volumes to the progress that's been made in recent years in, uh, in DEA's ARD atmospheric and, and BRDF correction um, uh, processing models. You know, this project has attacked, uh, attracted a lot of attention internationally. Uh, ARD data providers in, in North America and, and Europe were, uh, uh, paid a lot of attention and, it, and in some senses some of these methodologies will be rolled out. Now, in phase one, uh, we, we, we did anticipate that we were going to move to our passes uh, at some point and we were fortunate enough to be able to contract Dr. Stefan Meyer from MyTech uh, up in Darwin 
to undertake a, a, a trial during a, a Sentinel-2 overpass at the, um, uh, the Tropical Savannah site at Litchfield. You know, Stephen used this uh, little micro drone and, uh, and a Viz NIR sensor, a small Viz uh, Ocean Optics device. And as you can see, the matchup isn't bad, um, but uh, it only extends as far as, as, as the, the near infrared. Uh, and to this purpose, you know, we've purchased a, 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 an RPAS mountable full range spectrometer for phase two. And here's a little bit of a summary of the, the hardware that we've, we've um, accumulated over the last uh, a couple of years. Uh, we've got a couple of, uh, 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 there are three um, uh, platforms as such, uh, DGI Matrice, which is in the bottom left there with uh, its ancillaries. Uh, we're awaiting delivery, um, it's in freight at the moment, of a Ace Core Heavy Lift NOAA drone, uh, and, and that is potentially going to carry the, uh, the SR3500 over there on the right. Uh, uh, that's the full range spectrometer that in, in a sense is an analogous instrument to the ASD. Uh, and we've also bought a, a LiDAR Velodyne Puck to do some uh, uh, assessments of uh, a structural mapping. Yeah, as, as uh, Steph uh, has sort of shown, uh, you can use, uh, the first thing RPAS is good for is uh, third generation photogrammetry. And this is uh, just some screen grabs of my learning how to use that on a couple of our field sites. It is a formidable tool. The, the cameras in these little drones are, are really quite uh, uh, fantastic. And, and yes, the geocoding is getting very good. And the days of doing manually derived uh, ground control and tide points are well truly over. Um, so what are our priorities um, going forward? Um, we want to complete the systems design and integration and testing. We want to extend our phase one surface reflection measurement model to RPAS. We want to define the sources of, of and quantify the measurement uncertainties. Uh, we want to extend our surface reflectance validation into sloping and heavily vegetated sites and structure for motion. Longer term goals. Uh, is to see whether we can uh, use a, an RPAS spectrometer to, to measure BRDF. Um, and, uh, and there are some other things, you know, you could use a structure for motion or LIDAR to uh, quantify palm dam volumes when they're empty, of course. And the little GIF on the top there sort of speaks to what the uh, advantage of the, um, uh, the, the drone is uh, in that it will allow us to, to fully uh, sample the, the, you know, every square centimetre of a, of a field site, whereas when we actually walk at the moment, um, the reason we choose homogeneous sites is that the assumption is that if we do six or six, eight, nine, ten lines, then we are, we are substantially quantifying the variance. So what it is we're going to do in phase two is really try and bootstrap um, our, our sampling strategy across to the new sensors. So we've been using this ASDFR in the field and we have a, a fairly well defined and very successful sampling methodology. The proposition is to bring our new sensors is in and, and repeat that sampling methodology on the ground, then put the, put the uh, uh, sensor on, on, a, on a platform and, uh, and fly it while also sampling the site with the ASD. Uh, and this is a way of just constraining and understanding what uh, whether we're introducing um, other levels of uncertainty in, in the processing model. And these uh, these uh, graphs sort of show some of the results that we've done today. Uh, the other thing we're, we'd be really keen to do, and, and we've done some tests, uh, uh, we've done a couple of test flights for this, Mark's uh, defined a, 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 flight, uh, a flight plan that allows you to em uh, emulate uh, uh, the um, uh, BRDF, BRDF measurement uh, required to, uh, normally you'd, you'd use an instrument like that on the left, which is a, a goniometer, uh, but the drones or UAVs are uh, eminently capable of doing this, we feel, and uh, we've done a proof of concept flight plan with the virtual uh, droneometer at, uh, at our local field sites, albeit with the camera only. Uh, we're just waiting to get the uh, uh, full range spectrometer on the, on the new platform and then we'll try that uh, uh, properly. Uh, okay, so, uh, you know, the RPAS is going to enable validations to begin over complex terrain and vegetation. We've recently gained landholder approval uh, to begin surveys up at uh, Kura Digby Station, which is up on the shores of Lake Burrinjuk. As you can see from that Google Earth grab, um, you know, there are a range of uh, 
uh, landscape facets there. There are a range of, range of vegetation densities, but it's also adjacent to uh, a fairly deep water reach of um, Lake Barangjuk. Uh, there is a, a CSIRO team from ONA who have been tasked by DEA to, uh, uh, to audit the um, IOPs of inland waters. And uh, you know this site would, would allow us to do actually a coincident data take, which would be a, a very interesting sort of a proposition in its own right. So look, as I said, it, you know, context is everything. Um, you know, data cubes uh, and, and analysis ready in, imagery have really brought about a, a golden age in earth observation. And, and ARP has as a sense of miniaturisation, they're sort of reaching an operational maturity at a perfect time. So here at GA, look, we're really well placed to take advantage of this. And, uh, and sort of we look forward to being able to present the results of this work um, going forward at some point in the future. But thank you. I'll pass you over mine. Okay, thanks, Guy. Uh, so just very quickly, I was just going to show some possibilities of what you can uh, actually do with an RPAS. Uh, so as Guy's mentioned, uh, uh, LiDAR. So the LiDAR we have here, uh, it essentially scans 16 lines and produces a bunch of points, but you can turn those points into a, uh, into a very, very detailed structural model. Uh, so there's many, many different types of LiDAR systems, and the one we have is fairly cheap, and they can be, you know, four, five hundred thousand dollars. You can do some really good stuff with LiDAR. Uh, things like these um, multi-spectral cameras that you can get from a company called Microsense. So they, they actually, uh, in the dual system, they can capture ten bands. So with the right software, you can fly these over, say, your vineyard, and you can actually start picking out where there's actually trouble. Uh, so it'll allow you to do that without actually having to walk out and look at every uh, single. Uh, um, branch. Uh, full range co aligned hyperspectral images, uh, also very expensive um, and they're quite new, uh, but these will replicate what you can do with an airborne uh, survey. Uh, so it makes it much easier because you don't have to get a plane in, you don't have to get a pilot. More common are the um, Visnir IR systems because they're a lot cheaper and smaller, and you'll see on the right hand side this one's actually being um, uh, coupled with a, a LiDAR, so you can get your hyperspectral and your structure at the same time. Uh, so other things, and this is just a quick search on the internet and from things that I've, I've been aware of, you can hang a magnetometer off the bottom of your drone. Uh, so you can do a detailed magne uh, magnetomic survey. Um, so maybe to complement what can be done with an airborne system. Uh, you can do ground penetrating LiDAR, and I've actually seen uh, some people at the USGS trying to do bathymetry over a lake with a ground penetrating LiDAR. Uh, something like a radiation detector, so if you want to fly over Fukushima and uh, not irradiate yourself, also very useful. You can put air quality monitors, so, um, so if you want to fly over a stack or something, you know, rather than having to climb up there on a, um, on a, a scaffold or something. And things like um, forward-looking infrared LiDAR, so um, they use that for um, looking at um, wind turbines, uh, electrical systems and stuff like that. So the future of flying at GA, so um, it's now a sense of accreditation, much easier to fly in what's called the excluded zone. So you don't actually need a recall to operate anything under two kilos. Uh, since we don't really have any um, guidelines for RP operation at GA, we'd like to maybe come up with some. So some sort of minimum training, some standard operating procedures, uh, what uh, WHS provisions we've got for uh, operations. So as I mentioned, we can now fly GA, but we, we don't really have any policy around that sort of stuff. And we'd also look at some, like to look at some drone management software so we can have our fleet of drones in, inside a single operating uh, management system. Uh, so that we can keep a track of everything. Um, plus, since most of the drone pilots at GA are in this room, we'd also like to do a, a, a community of practice so we could discuss all these things and keep people updated uh, and, and generally make this a, a sort of a business-wide um, community of practice. So just in conclusion, uh, drones are pretty much here to stay and they'll probably re replace a lot of existing practices. And uh, as Steph mentioned, they, they're also a good way of um, the missing link between, say, an airborne survey and going out and doing it with your own eyes, so you can get um, that uh, resolution in between those those two type, types of things. These things can be very complicated, so both from a technical and a legisl legislative point of view. Um, so there's a fair bit of a, a learning curve when you start one of these sort of drone programs off. Um, but I think the present presentations have shown that. Um, there's all manner of possibilities, and it's just a matter of money and um, imagination, I think, to what you can actually do with a drone. And even just a simple camera drone, you can get some very, very powerful science out of it. 
So that's it. So um, any questions? Thank you very much. And, and thank you to the team for a fabulous presentation. Uh, and I, I would say congratulations on managing to get through all of the speakers and still giving us some time for questions. So there's a whole bunch of questions in the chat already and I'll, I'll try to get through those as quickly as we can. I might start with one for Andrew uh, and then I'll switch back to the rest of the team. So Andrew, Gareth Davies asks, how difficult is it to train the AI to recognize the sharks? And is it only using existing data you collected or can pre-existing data be used as well? I think um, any data can be used for this as long as it's good quality. That's really, really important. So we normally deal with 4K video. Um, if the video is highly compressed, then the AI model is probably going to pick out that compression algorithm more than it will real animals. The other important thing that we found is that um, the early data was based on, I think, uh, Lennox and Ballina beaches. And then the trials included both Byron Bay and Kingscliff, both of which um, look quite different um, than the pre-trained model. So we found that it did a pretty poor job as soon as we went to a new beach. So we know that if we go to any other beaches from now on, we need to include some background data on those beaches. Great, thanks, Andrew. Uh, I've got a question here from Clive Collins for Dan, which is you, you showed a large difference between the INSAR and the drone elevations. Can the INSAR data be calibrated using the drone data at one or a few sites to correct for differences at other locations? Or do we have to acquire drone data every single time? Uh, yes, the INSAR data can be calibrated using the drone data. And I did that as part of the Lake Mirror earthquake study. Um, I guess the the uncertainty there is whether the the slip vector or the motion vector of the earthquake um, you have to uh, make sure that you've captured the range of slip vectors so that you, you're not applying one correction for the entire earthquake, for instance, because bits are going all over the place. Um, but you can also uh, I should mention, in fairness to the Insar people. If you collect ascending and descending past INSAR, you can get a uh, an independent uh, motion vector, not just a line of sight vector. So, but that's more expensive. Thanks, Dan. Uh, so, there's a question here for Steph from Richard Jacker around um, all the imagery that you were showing in the, the elevation models. Is that all captured with the OEM Mavic's camera on the drone? Yeah, that's right. So that's using, um, yeah, on the Mavic 2 Pro, it comes with a 20 megapixel Hasselblad. Um, it's got a fixed focal length. Um, so really, your, your zooming and, and resolution is dictated by your uh, flight height. And yeah, it's it's all collected um, doing that. And we process it using um, Agisoft Metashape. Great. Thanks, Steph. Uh, so, and, and we'll have time for some more questions. So if other people have ones they want to put in chat, please feel free to add them now. Uh, Andrew, this, uh, sorry, Mark rather, there's a couple here I think for you. So one from Bex, which is what actually counts as an incident? Uh, and another question from Jenny Rowland about, you know, if they've been trialing drones for takeaway deliveries, do they need to get an exemption to fly at night? Um, yes, the first one, uh, an incident would be something like a flyaway or a crash or a, a, an injury to somebody, uh, th those sort of things. Um, uh, it's, it's essentially something that's uh, dangerous would be an incident that has to be reported to um, the ATSB. So um, if for some reason you uh, you have a rough landing because it's windy or something and you, you might damage a propeller or something, that's not really what you call an incident. It's just a, just a heavy landing. It's more of those more serious things that have to be reported. Uh, and as for the um, the drone delivery, they'd have their own REOC. So they'd have their own set of agreements they have with CASA. Uh, and so, I mean, we can fly at night too if we um, if we, we uh, seek approval from CASA. So anybody with a REOC has the power to do these sort of things if CASA agrees that they can do it safely. Great, thanks. Uh, so there's, a, there's another question that's just been added. Um, so I suspect that using two or more drones, sorry, from Joe, uh, two or more drones at once would help identification of animals and small scarp changes. Uh, indeed, swarms of drones could provide an opportunity to acquire data that couldn't be collected with current technologies. Uh, how close are we to this? And I think, uh, Dan, I might go to you in the first instance. Yeah, um, so part of flying in the excluded category is you can only fly one drone at a time. So. 
if you want to fly multiple drones, then you have to do it under an operating certificate and you have to get CASA exemptions for that, which is not necessarily a big issue. People do fly swarms of drones. Um, but I guess uh, the simplicity is what I was looking for. And I'm going to a very remote location. Charging the batteries is a limitation. So doing repeat over overpasses with one drone in this case was more efficient than flying several drones, for instance, for that stereo view. And did anyone else want to speak to that, Steph, in terms of for your work? Um, yeah, I guess picking up on Dan's point about simplicity, um, at the moment we're able to get, as you've seen, great resolution um, and, a, and a huge amount of data uh, with a fairly simple setup. Um, if we want to add extra sensors and, and have you know concurrent data collection um, short you know in, in theory we can do that um, I, I don't think we're quite there for that need at the moment but there's no reason that we couldn't do it in the future great thanks Steph uh, so another question here from Matthew Hill which is the you know DGI systems are very popular and reliable are you considering other brands of aircraft or making your own custom aircraft a GA you know eg uh, heavy lift or fixed wind aircraft? Uh, and I might actually start. Um, Mark, did you want to speak to that first? Uh, certainly, yeah. So we've, we're have we expecting uh, a drone um, from a company called uh, Ace Corp. Uh, so this is actually uh, sort of hand-built out of uh, carbon fibre, uh, and it runs on a completely different operating system than, say, the DJI things. It uh, actually uses a, um, a, a thing called uh, Ardu Pilot. Um, so they also sell this as a, as a kit, so you can actually get the airframe and put all, all your own stuff in it. And in fact, if you have an airframe, you can buy all that, that kit that I showed and make your own drone. So it's completely possible, but um, rather than being a, like drone manufacturing experts, we're trying to buy something that's a bit more off the shelf just so we can we can deploy our sensors on it because we're not, we're not really drone um, experts. We're trying to be remote sensing experts. So the drone is just a tool. But yes, if you, you can go nuts. Um, at the moment, you can go out there and buy all your own stuff and make your own drone and have a great time. I might just add there, Trevor, that um, fixed wing aircraft offer advantages uh, in terms of extended range and, and they can have heavier batteries. Um, but in some testing that I have done with fixed wing aircraft in desert situations, they will attract eagles very much more readily than uh, quadcopters or rotary wing aircraft. So, uh, for instance, BHP in the Pilbara uh, loses um, fixed wing aircraft regularly. So that's something that you have to think about too, is that there are other things in the sky that will take you down. Thanks, Dan. And I, I kind of feel like we could have an entire another talk about um, ways to lose a drone, but let's not Let's not get into that right now. I'm, I'm conscious of time, colleagues. I'm going to just ask one last question uh, to the team. And I might actually start with you, Dan, and then, then allow others to speak to it as well. Um, but there's a question from Luigi, which is, what's the best way for external collaborators to access GA drone um, capability, you know, joint projects, for example? Uh, Dan, do you want to start with you? And I might give everyone a, a last chance to re reply to that before we close. Yeah, I guess at the moment we're in the early days of developing GA's drone capability, so we're not quite set up to the point where we can extend that beyond GA. But as Mark has talked to before, uh, we have collaborations with CSIRO. There's a um, drone operations facility at the University of Melbourne that I tap into as well. Um, and maybe Mark would want to continue too. Yeah, yeah we, um, we're sort of collaborating with uh, Tara Luma from University of Tasmania. Uh, and we're also uh, leaning on um, Renee from uh, DOOR up in uh, Darwin. So that they have programs that are far ahead of where we are at the moment. Uh, plus, um, we have been um, we have been working with Luigi as well. So we've been out in the field with Luigi and um, and Dale from um, uh, from University of what are they ANU from ANU. And yes, Luigi, a case of gears wouldn't go astray if you want to get some of our stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I, we will not let the minutes reflect that. Uh, Guy, did you want to add anything? And then Steph, I might, might come to you last, noting the time. Well, look, I suppose the, the point I would add is that, you know, collaboration is always an ideal because in a sense, there are still so many sampling issues uh, that need to be addressed in this process. You know, as I said, in going forward, the, the critical thing for us is to be able to 
to understand where our sources of variance and uncertainty are coming from. And uh, the, the the more heads, I suppose, and uh, you have uh, been prepared to analyse those data or access to different uh, uh, sensor systems, uh, then, you know, it, it really builds your confidence to actually understand what it is the sensor is seeing. But once we start getting into flying over over, over canopies um, at different sun angles, then, uh, you know, there's going to be a whole array of unknowns in that. And so there's an awful lot of learnings to be done. Um, certainly, you know, I, I know that um, Dale Hughes at, at the ANU has put an awful lot of effort into, into uh, configuring some bespoke uh, ground-based uh, sensors that are capable of looking, doing radiometry at, at different angles. So the integration of that type of uh, data set with, with an airborne data set would be, uh, there'd be a lot of science issues in that that could uh, uh, bear fruit. Um, right. But yes, yeah, certainly uh, there's an awful lot of opportunity for, for, for um, collaboration. Thanks, Guy. And I might then just, Steph, if you want the last right of reply to that, and then I'll close out with a, an update on future talks. Please, Steph. Thanks. Nothing more to um, really add other than, you know, the opportunities for collaboration are there. Um, reach out. We're, we're really happy to uh, collaborate and learn from others and, and see what we can bring to um, external projects as well. So get in touch. Which case, uh, thank you to all of our speakers today. Uh, that has been an absolutely fabulous presentation and a fascinating discussion at the end. Thank you so much. Uh, my final duty as chair is just to note that unfortunately next week there's not going to be a Wednesday seminar, but fear not, David Hazelhurst's talk has been um, rescheduled and his encore, uh, encore talk about the Agile Mindset will now be on November 25th. Before that, on November 18, uh, Dr. Carl Spandler will be giving us a seminar on unconformity-related rare earth element deposits, a new source of critical metal, metals for Australia, uh, which will talk about the geology and genesis of Australia's rare earth element ore bodies and highlight the potential for future ore discoveries, particularly in Australia's vast intracontinental sedimentary basins. So thank you all for coming along today and thank you again to our speakers for a fabulous presentation and hope to see you all on the 18th. Bye for now. Thank you. Cheerio. Cheerio.